Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics and in this video I'd like to discuss the latest article in the Tory media, the Times on this occasion, which tries to make the argument that you can't tax your way to growth. But when you read through their arguments, there are two elephants in the room which go completely unaddressed, which is, I suppose, the point of an elephant in the room. The first is that nobody ever suggests that taxation stimulates growth. But what stimulates growth is investment. You cannot grow the economy without investing. That's what should be said. You cannot grow the economy without investment. You have to invest in infrastructure. It's no coincidence that the last Labour government brought in investment and the economy grew and it grew the most when the investment was the highest. And it's also no coincidence that our economy is now smaller in real terms than when the Tories took over in 2010. They did not invest. In fact, cutting investment is all they ever did, from David Cameron right up to Rishi Sunak. In fact, things got so bad that Sunak was forced to describe fixing potholes as investment. No, mate, that's maintenance. Investment is essential if you want to grow the economy. But where does the investment come from? Now, the Tories will argue, of course, well, you, you cut regulations and create the conditions for the private sector to pump it in. Well, they had 14 years to try it their way and our economy is now smaller and the rate of tax is at record levels in modern times. I would say that 14 years is long enough to have tried out the experiment. The experiment did not work. So now being sensible, you've got two sources for that investment, borrowing and taxation. Well, the Tory media have convinced the voting public that borrowing is a bad thing. So that only leaves taxation then, doesn't it? Yes, in the long term, if you, if you can stimulate economic growth and as the economy grows, you naturally bring in more taxes via your tax receipts without having to raise the rate of tax. Sure. But when you've got a stagnant economy, you've got to kickstart that economic growth in the first place. That means raising the rate of tax still further. And anyone who complains about this, but also says we shouldn't borrow more, is effectively arguing for continued stagnation. Which is something, of course, the Tories would love. I mean, they, they encourage stagnation while they're in power. They definitely want economic stagnation when they're in opposition because it will bring them to power more quickly. Labour do not want that. But there is another problem with their thinking as well. So I was reading this Times article. And, and the Times is the least ridiculous of the Tory client media outlets, I have to say. And it lists various ways in which Rachel Reeves could raise individual taxes. And it explains how each one is either, oh, it's not worth very much, or could hamper economic growth. So raising capital gains tax, for example, they dismiss that, oh, it's not worth very much. And it's like, OK, maybe not. But it is worth something, isn't it? So equalise it with income tax anyway. You don't seem to have an argument against it, so you, presumably that's fine. As for the other taxes, like raising employer contributions on national insurance or raising fuel duty, there are indeed good arguments against doing this. I don't think that would be sensible. But this article, like so many others, it goes down these and it works on the basis that it's only possible to change taxes on income or sales of one form or other. And it does this in my view now, because it does it so consistently. So in my view, it's doing it as a deliberate con to their readers and viewers. Because taxing sales more, like putting up fuel duty, for example, yes, actually, that's going to cause people to spend less. I mean, we saw the reverse of this. After the banking crisis, what did Labour do? They reduced VAT. Why did they reduce VAT? Because they wanted to encourage spending. And it worked. What did the Tories do when they came to power? They put VAT up and it caused people to spend less. So yeah, if you tax sales in some form or other, you're going to cause people to spend less. You may or may not end up with more tax revenues as a result, but you are going to put the brakes on economic growth because people are spending less, right? So you want to think twice before putting sales taxes up. Taxing income can also result in a loss of investment. We have weird situations where people will limit the productivity of their business or themselves based on some form of an income tax or where investment decisions are scaled back or moved based on like, you know, like a business profit tax. So this is absolutely true. There are, you know, you could apply taxes like this and in a way that slows down or hurts economic growth. 
but a few weeks ago, there was a, a professor of economics explaining to the Financial Times about the benefits of changing the focus to taxing the land. This doesn't get mentioned at all. Like you could, for example, get rid of council tax, which is farcical these days. There are people living in semi-detached houses who pay more in council tax than Buckingham Palace. Right? The system's beyond a joke. But according to this professor, like you could get rid of it and replace it with a tax on land, which would actually mean most houses would end up paying less of the equivalent tax. So like you'd see your, in your council tax go be replaced by a different tax, like a land tax, which would end up being smaller. But you would still raise more in tax revenues because most land is owned by people not really paying anything. Because it's got, it's got other benefits as well. Like you could use it to determine or encourage certain uses for land. So imagine someone who buys land for development. They're gonna build houses on it, right? Okay, that's useful. But let's say they let it sit idle. They've got the planning permission, but they don't develop it for a little while. They hold off. They're waiting for the market conditions to maximize the profits for doing that, right? But we want the land developed as soon as possible because we need housing now. Well, the government could use this land tax to raise or lower the rate according to how usefully the land is being utilised. So, land that's got a home on it, that's occupied as a home, that could attract a lower rate because we need homes. Land that's used as an unoccupied home or a largely unoccupied home, let's say a holiday home or a second home or something, you could charge a higher rate for that because like, well, 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 not everyone's got enough houses. We don't necessarily need people to have second homes. So if you want a second home, you're going to have to pay more tax. Land being used for farming could have zero tax supply because we need that. Land being developed for something useful, like if there's actual construction going on for building houses or a business park or, you know, whatever, that could have a lower rate because you're using the land for something that's going to be useful. But land sitting idle, or where there's a few bricks there, but there's nothing really going on. They're not building quickly enough, waiting for a more profitable time. That could be hit with a really high rate of land tax. Oh, that land's not useful to society. So you will pay a higher rate of tax for it. And as is pointed out in the FT article, the thing about land is you can't just take it to the Cayman Islands. If you tax money in some form, rich people will move it abroad. Rich people will move money to, to reduce the level of tax they have to pay. You can't do that with land. And taxing land is also a good way of shifting more of the tax burden onto those who are very wealthy and under the current regime pay very little tax in this country. But these Tory client journalists, they never talk about that, do they? They only ever use examples of taxes where there genuinely is an argument that it could hurt economic growth if you go too far. But land tax reforms, that could be a real opportunity to change things. As I said, you can use land tax to encourage beneficial uses of land and discourage harmful uses by applying a higher rate of tax on things. It's like, yeah, that's not useful to us. And the landowner can do nothing to get out of it. I mean, they can sell the land, but then the new buyer has to pay the tax. You don't risk shifting investment out of the country this way. And if the landowner argues that they're using the land in some beneficial way to the country, oh, but this will generate lots of jobs when it's built. It's like, great, fantastic. Then you will pay a lower rate of tax as long as the Treasury agrees with your assessment. And I often find it curious how when you read these articles, they only ever list the standard ways in which taxes are leveraged in budgets. Reeves has got the opportunity here to shake things up with actual reform of the tax system. Now, I'm not sure there would be time to announce major reform in this coming budget because the budget will only have been like a few months after the election. But it would certainly open up a lot of possibilities if Labour, instead of just moving numbers about on the current system, actually changed the system. A bit at a time, potentially. A bit at a time, a little reform in each budget, this Parliament, until we're in quite a different place come the next election. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe for further content and click the like button. You can also sign up for memberships if you'd like to support the channel further. Thanks for watching. Until next time, I'll see you later.